Hi, I'm Matthew Kelly, and welcome to Profoundly Human. My guest today is Daryl Flash Gordon, and you are in for a treat. This is going to be a phenomenal conversation, so get comfortable, sit back, relax, listen, learn, and be ready for your life to change. Daryl, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here, Matthew. Thank you so much for the invitation. So I got to start with 1988, <laughs> Notre Dame, national champions. You are starting linebacker. Yes. What was that experience like? Wow, wow. You know, that, that, that experience was, was something that I don't think I expected to happen, right? And you say, well, why you say that? Because a few months before that, Colts Holtz told me he didn't want me to play for him. Mm. He said, you know, you, you finish your four years, you should just head home because I'm in my third year and we're not doing very well. And I have the boosters and I have the donors that are all on my putt about my success, right? And I brought some kids and I promised them that they would play. So I don't need you this year. And I was going to be going in my fifth year. And I've already planned to, to be present, right? To get my graduate degree and, and to hope lead the team to some sort of success. And uh, I said, coach, I, I'm not prepared to, to go out and go to the compines. All that has been done already. I, I wish you would have told me this earlier. He said, I'm sorry. I said, well, coach, we've got to find a new way, another way to do this. And he quickly responded back and saying, I'm going away for two weeks recruiting. I'll come back in two weeks. I'll make my decision. And during that time, I, I had this, uh, you know, I was so angry that I went to my room and I said, I don't think I want to play for the University of Notre Dame. I, I'm going home. And I packed my bags and I, as I was a child again, right? And I was walking out the door. And, um, and as I began to think through the process, I went back to my room. And for about a week, I just thought about it. And I changed the way I approached it. And I said to myself, I went to my assistant coach, my position coach. I said, coach, would you spend two hours a day with me? five days a week and just work on looking at film and helping me get better. He said, I'm in, I've never heard that request before. And then I went to my weight and strength coach and I said, would you train with me two hours a day, five days a week? He said, well, if we do that as a team, I said, I just want to do something extra. He said, okay. And, and, and we, I, I was, we were in. And then, um, so, so I felt comfortable about where I was going. Two weeks later, I get the phone call. Lou calls me into his office. I sit down. He says, Flash, I got some news for you. It's unfortunate news. I said, before you share, I said, I want to just tell you, I talked to the position coach and my own position coach, and he indicated he would be willing to work with me two hours a day, five days a week. He said, oh. I said, I also went to the weight coach, and I want to be better in that way. And he said he would work with me two hours a day, five days a week, and uh, therefore to become the strongest player at the end, I was the strongest player on the team, bench pressing approximately 470 pounds, right? Wow. So, it, and I was only weighing 120, 220 pounds. Um, and, and I said, coach, I will promise you during practice, I'll give you 120%. That means some people may get hurt, but I'm going to give you everything I got. As a result of that, I will be an example for those younger kids to follow as we begin to prepare ourselves for this season. Mm. That's what I'll give you. And he said, well, wow, I, I, I've never seen this response before from a 21 year old kid. And he said, well, I'm gonna watch you. We'll see what happens. And uh, as a result of all of that work, uh, I was captain of the team. We won a national championship. Um, uh, I got my graduate degree. I was able to go to the White House to meet with President Reagan and, and Vice President Bush. and and it's all because I changed, right? That, that experience, no other kid had to go through that, what I had to go through. And some of those other individuals that he talked to, they left. So, so what happens if we don't deal with our adversity and deal with the challenges that we have? Some of us walk away from it, and it could be great opportunities. I wouldn't have had a graduate degree. I wouldn't have had the experience at the White House. So, so when you say what kind of experience that was, the game experience was unbelievable. But what most of my colleagues did know is that I was fighting every day for my position. I was fighting every day to be on the team, and I was showing them that I could be a great mm. performer. Mm. 
Well, I have some follow-up questions right there. So uh, you mentioned you go back to your room, you're angry, and you said, I was a child again. What do you mean? You know, it's it's how we traditionally respond, right? And it's unfortunate, but but we're not mature enough. Even at our oldest ages, we're not mature enough to deal with adversity, right? And And as an athlete, we're in we're in a face we're in adversity all the time. We're facing it every day. It's fourth down and we it's two two yards to go. It's adversity, right? Or it's a test and you're not quite prepared for it's adversity. Or academically, you know, the institution says, listen, your grade point average is not where it needs to be. It's adversity. What do you do? And and I I think for me, if I did not have that built in, I would have left. Mm. But, but that adversity really helped me to overcome the challenges um, and go back and find out how I could get better. My other colleagues didn't learn that. Yeah. And they thought they were winning by leaving, right? And in fact, they watched us win a national championship on television. Yeah. Yeah. So now, cool. coach was Lou Holtz, right? That's correct. Lou Holtz. And what is he like? <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Lou Holtz is so unique. Right, because I had Coach Faust for two years, right, from the Cincinnati area. He left uh, um, the high school here in Cincinnati and went right to Notre Dame. And he was, a, he was a loving, great coach. But Lou Holtz was a guy that was interested in motivating each individual differently. So for me, he would motivate me in a way that <laughs> he would yell at me. But he knew that's what I needed because that's what mom and dad did. But for Tim Brown, the Heisman Trophy winner, Tim was a very spiritual guy and his family really caressed him and, and worked with him. And, and, and he knew that. So when he dealt with Tim, he dealt with Tim in a different way and, but got the most out of Tim so that Tim wouldn't be in a fetus position and wouldn't be useless to the team. Right. So often our coaches coach us all the same and some excel and some don't, but a great coach that understands the value of each individual presents themselves with a different way of being motivated. Um, now you're going to see great success um, from your team. And that takes time, but a great leader is willing to put the time in to build a great team. Fantastic. What about you? Go back to this room. You're angry. He's told you to go home. Um, a lot of people would they shrink back from that. They would say, my destiny is out of my hands. That's right. And, and I got to wait miserably and um, infuriatingly for two weeks to see what coach decides. But you took a very proactive approach. Um, were you inspired in that in the moment? Had you been taught that by somebody? Where did that come from? You know, you know it's interesting <laughs> you, you say that because that's the preface of my book. Change does not occur in a flash. And 80% of us, 80% of the American people, and I think it's 328 million people in America, and of those, 80% of them never change, only until we experience a severe degree of discomfort. Mm. So, you know, we, you think about that and you really let that resonate. If I don't do anything until something happens to me, until I have a divorce, and then all of a sudden I'm going to do something differently, or I just have to file bankruptcy, now I'm going to do something different. I just took the car. Right. Or 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 actually, I just got my D or my F. Now I'm going to step my game up, put down social media. Right. It's I'm going to we, we wait until then. Or the doctor says you got cancer. Right. And you need to do something now. Now I may stop eating your chips and working in a different way. But 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 we don't do that until we experience a severe degree of discomfort. I found through many of my examples in my life that what I was doing was the 80%, right? And I realized I didn't want to live in that kind of space. I wanted to be proactive in that space. And from that point forward, when I recognized what I was doing, I began to, to operate. Now, it was, it was innate when I was young. Um, but I don't know if that came from my dad, who, who you know, was an entrepreneur and, and really fought through many challenges coming up from the South and, and starting his own, you know, a Texaco station and an auto repair shop. And, and you know, with, with all the financial challenges that he had to go through to try to get there, I saw him persevere. I saw him never give up. And I saw him develop relationships with people in order to continue to grow. 
right? And I and I thought, wow, maybe maybe this there's something there. And I think in our subliminal, <laughs> you know, it's something that 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 we begin to practice as well. Mm -hmm. So so um, that was probably when when my development came and my change came, and I felt like I want to get ahead of it. But I also thought, Matt, that. I wanted to get that master's degree. I wasn't thinking the national championship. Sometimes God is, God works in mysterious ways. I was just thinking, he's going to take my master's away by not going to my fifth year. And and in going through my fifth year, I helped a team win a national championship, right? So so there was more to that and going to the White House and having broader experiences. That for me was, was huge. Mm. Yeah. A lot of people don't believe they can change. Mm -hmm. And um, probably everybody who is watching this mm -hmm. needs to change something about themselves or about their life. That's right, that's right. What would you say to that person? <laughs> you know, I said it to your team earlier, and I think there are five to six things that we can focus on. One is our, our, our relationships. Whether they're solid or not, we need to evaluate it. The next is your finances. Either doing well or doing bad, but evaluate it. The other is our careers. Are we happy where we are? Are we just going to work every day? Right. That's, that's another area that needs our attention so that we can find ourselves working in a place that we feel like is home. Right. And, and then there's the academic piece. Some of us are going to college or school and we're getting D's and F's and we're not capturing the very essence of academia, right? So, so why are you there? What, what's the purpose? Get off the social media. So, so looking at that. And then the last two, I think, is the spirituality. And many of us, many of us don't pray until something happens, mm. right? Then we get closer to God. Yes. And then the final is the health and wealth, wellness of ourselves, like just getting up and doing jog. I get up every day, 4.30, and I go to the gym. It's just always been the way I live, and that's the way I continue to live. The, those pieces, if you can evaluate those five pieces or six pieces of your life and make sure they're in on track, um, you find so much peace in your life. Uh, and that's where you know I find my peace, uh, making sure those are all in, in order. Fantastic. Yeah. Did Lou ever tell you what he was going to tell you? <laughs> You know what? He never told me what he was going to tell me. He always just told me, <laughs> right? Yep. He just said, this is where we're going. This is what we're going to do. And this is how we're going to get there. And you were either on board or not. But he had three phrases that we all live by. It was by trust, love, and commitment. Mm. So we trust ourselves and everybody that we're in a room with, like your team, you trust them then you're committed to that team. Like whatever we do, we're going to make sure we produce the best opportunity, the best show every time we, we, we put a show on the, on the air. And, and, and the love piece, right? It's, it's not just I love my wife or my, my girlfriend, but I love my colleagues. I love the people I work with. I love, you know, the people I play ball with. We, we have a strong bond. And those were three phrases of our lives that we all came together on. And I think we were successful with it and it won us a national championship. So you win the national championship. Did you ever reflect with Lou on the fact that you might not have been there? Did you guys ever talk about that? <laughs> Great question, Matt. Great question. I went to, after, after the national championship, you know, we had several banquets where we may have both been at, we may have shared the stage, or I may have been in the audience. And he, every time he would speak and I was there, he would tell the story about how he told Flash Gordon I didn't want him back. And I think it really moved him, right? Because he knew that that was the decision that he made that changed my life, right? And um, what's even more interesting about that in Lou Holtz's statement is two years later. Now, this is 30 years later, right? Now, two years ago, I talked to a gentleman uh, that played for Lou Holtz, and he was going into his fifth year, and he was just telling me about life, and he says, hey, hey Flash, I, when I played for Lou, you know, in my fifth year, he told me he didn't want me to come back. <laughs> <laughs> I, said, I said, what? He told me he didn't want me to come back. Mm. And I realized what he was really doing, right? He was trying to get us to play at our highest level. Yeah. And those who decided they didn't want to come back 
or they didn't want to take on that challenge, they would leave. So you really were vetting out the most powerful and the greatest guys that were committed to success and, and allow the others to go. And I think that was a, an unbelievable movement. And I, you know, later in life, we, we talked about it and, and he just smiled. He never, you know, committed to the, to the movement, but he, uh, he, 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 he was a master motivator. And I think that's what made him so successful. Yeah. 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 You mentioned the White House and I read a little bit um, about your visit to the White House, um, President Reagan honoring you. Um, what was that like? Well, you know, I, I always, <laughs> we all laugh about it because um, there was McDonald burgers there for us for lunch, right? And we're like, well, we eat McDonald burgers. We won the national championship, but that's probably tradition, right? Um, but it was such an, an awesome experience to be in the Oval Office and then to be outside in the White House grass and, and watch the president come by and the entourage of Secret Service. And there's 120 of us uh, players and coaches and assistant coaches. And, um, and to receive this award, right, for being the pinnacle of collegiate athletics. And I think um, it's my own personal opinion, but, you know, uh, Coach kind of shared it. It's, it was special. That one was special in 1988 because it was University of Notre Dame. It was a Catholic institution that was founded on faith and education and, 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 and success in athletics. And you can't buy anything where you're asking players that are committed to excellence, but also academics and but also spirituality, mm. right? So that, that combination of those three, I think moved the president enough to say, wow, you guys overcame a lot of adversity because there are some schools that don't even require significant academic challenges, right? Or, or the spiritual part is not even part of their heritage or, and, and, um, or the uh, athletic prowess where there's all Americans behind all Americans at Notre Dame, right? So you just hope to get an opportunity to play if yes. you can. Yes. So it was great. It was, it was an unbelievable experience. And I, I would have loved to have done it again and again and again. Unfortunately, I got one opportunity. That's the last time we actually won an Astro Championship. So I, we just had Marcus Freeman at our facility. And, and I'm saying, hey, you know, I love wearing my ring and I love being a national champion, but it's way too long <laughs> to be the last national champion. So he said he's going to try to change that. So we'll see what happens. Good, good, good. <laughs> Do you remember the first time someone called you Flash? Yes. You know what? It, I was, ooh, I think I was 17 years old and I had a brother and my brother uh, was Flash Gordon and he was a, a pro boxer, Golden Gloves champion. And he was just a, a movie star all on his own. And I remember just going to his boxing matches in New Jersey in Atlantic City. And I used to watch him and I was in awe of, of this 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 guy he'd get up at five in the morning and he'll run five miles right before high school before going into high school and i was in middle school and and he was the guy he was the flash gordon um, um that we all admired and i said you know i'd love to take that name and i'd love to make it national if i could and um and that's when at uh when i was in high school um you know, I just worked hard every day. And I remember the first day we were in practice at the University of Notre Dame, I was stretching and Coach Faust walked over and after one practice, he saw how fast I was. He said, I think we're gonna call you Flash Gordon. And after that, um, no one ever knew my name as Daryl Gordon. They even announced me on the intercom system making a tackle by Flash Gordon. So in the program is called Flash Gordon. So no one even knows my, my real name. So it's, it started uh, by Coach Faust, and I, I think him every day, and sometimes I don't, about the, the name change. Sure. Uh, it, but it's, it's, been a, it's been a blessing to have. So 1988, you win the national championship. Uh, here we are, 2023, uh, 35 years later. What do you consider your purpose in life to be, and, and, and how, do you, how did you arrive at that purpose? You know, I, I remember reading A Purpose Driven Life and and I remember always asking myself when I was working, why am I working and what am I doing and 
what is really my purpose in life? What moves me and motivates me to, to, to be in a place that I would really love being and doing the work that I love doing. And, and I realized my purpose was to help others. Everything I was doing, it was to help others be great, reach their full potential. So my, my, premise has always been, you know, to help others reach their full potential. So that That is my purpose. So in life, you know, I worked for the NCAA, uh, National Collegiate Athletic Association, and I, I was in the legal department, but I started doing some work in um, character development for youth. And it just, I just gravitated to it, Matt. And I don't know why, but I did, right? And I was helping youth throughout the state of Indiana. We had a program that Lily uh, sponsored for us for $5 million. And, and then I left and I, I visited this children's home, I remember, and it was called Warner Youth and Family Treatment Facility. And I, when I got there, I just, it was a place that God said, this is where you need to be. And I'm like, wait a minute, I got an undergrad, a graduate degree, a law degree, did Harvard where I, this is not where I'm supposed to be, right? And, and I just kept getting that calling. Hmm. Like, this is where you need to be. And, um, and you know, that was, that was for me the transformation um, um, of just knowing that I needed to be in that particular place at that particular time, um, doing that particular work. Right? Mm. Um, so, so it, it's it's been a it's been a journey, <laughs> you know. It's been a it's been an interesting journey of getting to where I am and understanding my purpose is to help others. And Warren's Youth and Family Treatment Center is a facility where we provide therapeutic treatment for young men and women that have been abused, neglected, or abandoned. So these are the at-risk, troubled youth uh, in the state of Indiana and Ohio that are really needing help. And and it's a place where I think I call I call home, right? And um, and I also go on on the road and I speak to many groups about their process of changing and helping them change and helping them get to where they really want to be in life. And if I can inspire that, I, I feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Warren Lee, and um, I think I read the sentence like 140 years old. Is that correct? Yeah, 140, probably two now, maybe 41, 42 years wow. old. So you're right on it. How, yeah. how did it come about originally? You know, it, it was a it was an orphanage. It was Warren Lee's children's home 142 years ago. And... Our kids, the Lutheran kids, would actually reside at this facility. It was just a it was just a home um, where they would plow the grass and 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 the and the farming areas. And they had you know the folks that lived in the home. It was one huge twenty thousand uh, square foot home, and everything happened there: education, recreation, and hundred acres. And it was a place where. When mom and dad went to war or when there was no mom and dad, they dropped the kids off there that were Lutheran. And it, we evolved over the years to become a residential facility and then became a residential treatment facility. So today we probably don't serve Lutherans. We serve all denominations uh, of kids throughout the state and uh, in the region. Um, but but that's how we kind of we kind of started. And there's a gentleman by the name of Carl Warnley. He he actually frequented the church right there in the Richmond area, mm. and he gave um, five hundred dollars to start wow. the church and uh, and the facility. And from there, you know, we've just grown uh, to be who we are today. That's amazing. Yes, yes, amazing. Yeah. That one man's generosity. Yes, yes. So One hundred and forty years later, it's it's interesting because <laughs> you know Lou Holtz came uh, to speak, and you know one thing I. I shared, sometimes we don't know the profound effect we have on other people. And sometimes we say, oh, I'm only affecting one person, right? And I, I was able to share with him on stage that, you know, your, your transformation in me, into me, has helped transform thousands of families and children. You never knew you did that, but you did it through me, yes. right? So, so we don't know how we are transformational in our own lives, but sometimes it's just one conversation with one person. That person may change the world, but it's a result of your planting the seed, right? So he was very thankful, but he never thought that way. But he realized, wow, yeah, I'm, I'm having a profound difference on people.
We're always influencing people. Amen. Every day, all the time, just like you are every day as you share your word uh, to thousands and thousands of people all over the world. Thank you. Thank you. I want to talk about a phrase I've heard you speak in, yes. in, in some of your speeches. Disrupting who you are to ignite who you want to become. <laughs> talk to us a little bit about that. Wow. That's, that's a, that, for me, it, it's always been a powerful statement for me because I realized I got to get out of my own way, right? I got to be able to disrupt my comfort zone. And, and that 80% conversation is exactly where that, that comes from, is if we don't change, if we don't find a way to change before we are in an uncomfortable state, we will find failure in our lives. We will be in trauma. Um, or we will deal with so many other challenges. So when we see organizations, when we see individuals and they always seem to be in crises, it's because they're not changing. They refuse to until the end. Yeah. Um, so, so that statement just means a lot about like, let's just, let's deal with it. When Holtz told me, I don't want you back, I dealt with it. Yeah. Or I could have not dealt with it, let it have a profound effect on my life, which would have been in a negative way. Sure. So, so that that statement, I think, I live by today. So, I love adversity because I get to put that statement into action. Mm. Yes. Yeah. When you get the opportunity to speak to young people in a group, what is your main message to those young people? You know, it's it's. They're always able to. They're always able to change. You know, there is nothing in our lives that we can't change. Nothing, until they understand that, right? So they're in a situation today where, you know, my son says I wanted to be a great quarterback, and he was in eighth grade, and he wasn't a good quarterback, and he just said he wanted to be. I said, so are you prepared? to make the transformation, whatever is required. Now, if you are, I'm in with you. If you're not, let's move on. I, I want to be a great quarterback. From that day, we transformed him. And many individuals says, he should be a running back. He should be a wide receiver because he's not a good quarterback, right? I said, just, just keep following the, 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 the path that we're leading here. Four years later, he, he's, Recently got offers from all the military academies, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Brown, um, um, UPenn. So it's the, what he thought he couldn't do, Yes, we did. Yeah. As a result of his commitment to change and living life differently, which means he had to get up in the morning, which means he had to eat differently, which means now his academics had to definitely make a you turn <laughs> because he wouldn't have had those opportunities in the Ivy Leagues if his grades would have remained where they were. So, so I tell every child, right, whatever it is you want to do, it's all about the hours you got to put into mm. it to make the transformation. And, you know, there's a great book that's called The Outliers, right? And it talks about the 10,000 hours. You, you, whatever you want to do in life, you got to put the hours in to make yeah. the transformation. I, I challenge all of them to that. Yeah. Yeah. In the book, you talk about um, how important it is for for parents to model. Talk to us a little bit about that. Everything we do, it's amazing how our parents, um, how we mimic our own parents. And I was sharing with you earlier that you said, "Well, Daryl, why do you feel, where do you feel like you got that change, you know, personality from?" And I, my dad didn't know he was sharing it. But I was watching him. He didn't tell me. I just watched how he operated. And I mimicked those same characteristics. So my daughter said yesterday, uh, she said, Dad, I was at Harvard and I got a butter pecan ice cream. And I thought about you. I was like, oh, butter pecan. You know, that's my favorite. So I know that's why I got it, you know? And I said, well, I never told you guys that. Was my I know we just watched you. I said, well, you know, what's even more interesting. You know, my dad just died in November of last year. I said, that was his favorite ice cream. That's the only reason why I love it. Cause I used to 
you ride with him and you stop at the ice cream store and you always get a butter pecan milkshake. And, and it's, it's what we, we, we mimic those same uh, philosophies of our children. So I try to be honest. I try to make sure in front of him, everything I do, I do with morals and ethics um, um, and, and with, with spiritual thought processes. So he got his first check. I said, how much of that are you putting away? How much of that are you giving to God? Right. That's if we don't talk about that, he doesn't know because he blew the whole check. You know, the first check of his lifeguard experience, he blew it all. Right. So, you know, I'm I'm committed to trying to help people, you know, just help them change yeah. and see that space where they can. Let's talk about the other end of that. Um so you you describe a great modeling experience from your father to you. We're all, as you describe, massively influenced by our parents. That's right. But then you go and you do this work at Warnley with these young people who uh, haven't had that experience at all or have had a bad or negative experience. And... And none of our parents are perfect. That's right. And so some of the things they model to us, we have to avoid and undo. That's right. That's right. That's right. How do you talk to the young people about rewiring ourselves or selecting, okay, I'm going to allow this influence or I need to move away from this influence because I'm now aware that it isn't the best influence on me? You know what? I, I always try to tell them, what is your purpose? Once you understand your purpose... And once they understand their purpose, they can weed out the things that they should be involved mm. in, the things that they shouldn't. Mm. So when I realized my purpose was to help others um, reach their full potential, and that was my vision and mission statement, then the boards that I was going to be on were the ones that were aligned with that. Yeah. The school that I was going to was going to be ones that were aligned with that. The people I hung around were the people that were aligned with that. It helped bring so much clarity to my life. And I share with them, what are you... What's your, what's your purpose? Why are you here? And once I understand why they're here, I'm saying, okay, let's put everything into that, into helping you get there. So, you know, they begin to say, oh, now I'm not just living, right? Because everybody's just living. They yeah. just get up in the morning and they go, I'm like, why are you going? What, <laughs> what's the purpose of you going to work today, right? And, and why did you have lunch where you had it today? And why did you agree to be on that board today? It's not even alignment with what you want to be or do, mm. right? So, so until we um, understand our purpose, it brings so much clarity to the direction of our lives and our children need to know that so that when they're picking YouTube videos and things like that, they can focus their attention on it. So yeah. when my son said he wanted to be the great quarterback, everything went into that. And we started, when he, when he bounced outside of that, we get back. Hey, I thought you said you want to be a great quarterback. I thought you said you want to have access to all University of Notre Dame. You want to be this Notre Dame quarterback. And to do that, you're going to have to perform better at school. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, so I just bring it back to, to the purpose and what they're trying to accomplish. You do a lot of um, speaking in the corporate world as well. Yes. Yeah. How does the message change or translate into the corporate world? Yeah. You know, and there's not much transformation, right? Because... It's applicable to all ages, all genders, all ethnicities, right? So when I'm talking about, you know, we talk about, you know, team transformation, uh, talk about change or even diversity, it's applicable to all of our groups. So when I'm talking to them, I'm talking to them about, you know, those six pieces of, we call them the flashpoints. And, and I talk about First, recognizing the thing you want to change. That's the facing, that's the F and the flashpoint. Once you recognize what it is in your organization that's that's troubling you, those flashpoints come into hand. Okay, now I faced up to it. Now the L, do you have the capacity to change? So some people say, hey, I want to run a 4-2-40. Matthew, right? I'm like, well, first of all, you're running a 5-6. <laughs> you know, it's probably never going to happen, right? So that's an unrealistic you know, uh, a change or goal that you have, but let's, let's make sure it's really, if you can check those two boxes facing up to it, like I'm ready now to make the transformation. I may have been hurt and I'm ready and I'm, and I have the capacity to do it. Then the A is really the action plan. 
Now you put up, I talked to organizations about putting a plan in the place, a strategic plan, and bring the brightest people in your circle to help develop that plan. After that, the S on the flashpoint is, is your support system. I think it's the most important. So, you know, what is the support system? It's, it's our ability to tell our corporate, corporate folks or even our children, hey, DJ, what's your goal? So he wrote, I want to, you know, I want to run, I want to have 5,000 total purpose yards. I want to have 73%. Okay, did you share that? Well, no, no, I'm just kind of, just me and you, Dad. Well, why don't you tell your coach? Well, what if I don't reach the goal? So they decide not to mm. have conversations with anybody other than ourselves. I said, why do you think you do that? He doesn't really know why, but he's afraid of failure. So if I don't reach it, then they all know I didn't reach my goal. But what if they all were support systems for you? And now your coach knows that you want to do 5,000 yards this year. So maybe he'll help you in giving, letting you stay in the game longer. Or maybe he'll help you in assuring you get enough throws in to get your completion percentages, right? It, these folks all help. And your mother, how if your mother knew, then maybe she's feeding you different types of food. Where right? Everybody can contribute to where you're trying to go, but you got to share it and have a support system. And then the final one was the holding on to it. So, you know, so often is that person that comes and says, I lost 20 pounds, right? It's great. Next year they gain 40, mm. right? So how do we make sure that when we accomplish it, I went talk with an organization about accomplishing, how do you hold on to that accomplishment and keep going? If, you, if your profit margins were 20%, how do we make sure the next three years it's gonna be 20%, maybe it's 30%, right? And that's, it's applicable to, to, to all facets of life. So, so it's been a great tool um, that I've used in my life and, you can apply that to the very stories I shared with you. That's exactly how I got out of them. Uh, and during the adversity, I put an action plan together. Um, I had it, you know, let's, let's think about the one with Wu Holtz. I had an epiphany. I was ready to change the, I had the capacity to change and I didn't leave. I put an action plan together. I went to my coaches. I said, would you work with me two hours a day? I went to my strength coach. Would you work with me? And I told Wu Holtz, if you give me, I'll give you 120%, right? That, that was the action plan that I put together. And then the support system, I share that with everybody on the team and I shared it with my coaches. So they knew what I was supposed to do and how I was gonna achieve it. And then holding on to it, we won a national championship, right? I, we didn't just win those games, we, we made it all the way through to a national championship. So, so that works in, in all facets of life if, if you're willing to commit yourself to it. So I, we've tried to patent it and, and it's been, highly studied through Harvard and all about this process of change and, um, and it helps and it works. Mm. What sort of resistance do you get to the message in the corporate world? You know, I, the, the probably the biggest resistance is, am I ready to that F am I ready to face up to the change process? Do I see an issue in my organization? And, and if I do, am I ready to attack it? It might be a vice president that's not providing the productivity that you need. It might be a quality assurance person that's not really committed and that can help transform the agency and maybe the leader of the organization doesn't have a vision, right? And they don't want to touch it. They're afraid to touch it. And until you get to the point where you're saying, when you're ready to face up to it, then we can have a conversation. But if you're not willing to, it, it, there's no need for me to be here. Yeah. Right. So, so that's the challenge I think. Um, and the pushback I would get more often than not is when I'm in an organization and I can see the issue and I can hear the issue and I understand the church issue. Now, are y'all willing to, to make the transformation? If not, let me know when you are. And then I, then I think we can go through this flashpoint process and build a, a better model for you so that you can be sustainable. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. What advice would you have for um, for athletes or aspiring athletes, whether they're seven years old or 17 years old or playing in college? What would you have for them? Wow, well, great question. You know, I, I was telling my two kids, I wish I had more. And I was telling your team, I wish I had more kids. I only have two. 
you know, and a daughter that was an all-state basketball player and a, and a son that's an all-state football player. And they're both D1 athletes too, but, but they're highly successful athletes and, and educated kids. Um, my, my commitment to, to them has always been, um, I will work with you if you want to achieve something. That's my purpose in life is to help you reach your full potential. That's, I didn't know that's what my purpose was back then, but that's what I was doing in everything I was doing, right? It was never about me. It was about how can I help somebody else grow? So, you know, and when they committed themselves to it, I put time in, but, you know, I tell them it's really about time, your commitment to a project and staying focused and staying on it for a long period of time will bring success. Yeah. I don't care how awkward you are. I don't care how unintelligent you think you may be. Success is still available to you if, in fact, you are going to be committed for a long period of time. I'll go back to the 10,000 hours and, I, and it, it, it works. But you, it's got to be, you got to figure out what it is that that person wants to be to excel in. So, you know, we talk about athletes. What advice would I give them? Where do you really want to be and what type of athlete do you really want to be? Do you just want to play in a mule ball? Do you really want to play college ball? Do you want to go to the pros? Because each one of them require different kinds of, of, of approach. Yes. Right. And, and then if you want to go to college, what kind of college do you want to go to? You want to go to an academically strong college or just a, a regular college where you can get your football in or your basketball in or your soccer, right? It's, so all those questions mean something as it relates to how we get there. Now, once, I, once we know, now everything we put in place will require long-term commitment for you to get to where you want to be in the academic endeavors and being a great history major or attorney or doctor is going to require time. And uh, I, I tell my daughter all the time, she wants to be a cardiothoracic surgeon. I said, that's another eight years. Like, that's a long time. Are you committed? Is that what you want? Because if you're wavering at any, any moment, if you're wavering on this movement, don't do it. Right. Right. So I'm committed. I want this. The doors are open. <laughs> mm. Right. The doors are open. Yeah. Right? And now we're all in to help you move progressively forward to be great. And that's what we do. Amazing. I want to come back to the book. A couple of things, a couple more things you talk about in the yes. book. One that I found fascinating is you talk about learning when to move on. Mm. Say a little bit about that. <laughs> you know, that's probably, that's a challenge that I have in my life, right? Because sometimes when we move on, does that mean we failed, right? Or does that mean we just aborted? Yeah. And, and we felt like we've done everything we possibly could do. Um, you, you know, moving on um, has a lot of uh, connotations to it. And um, I'm a believer that there is a point when you should move on, right? There is opportunity uh, that lies and awaits you, but you have to get through the current situation you're in and sometimes you just have to leave it right you just you can't do any more for it you can't grow it anymore you can't do anymore it's just time to move on and um, um so that you can be great in another space like so so <laughs> statistics for me was not my love <laughs> but i worked so hard in trying to excel in statistics and, um, and I remember being at Notre Dame and I, man, I just struggled with that course, but I was not going to just leave it. I'm like, listen, I'm going to keep trying. I, and I had another year for it. I took it another year. Call me crazy, but, but I should have left it. Yeah. I could have taken another course, but I, I took it again. Yeah. And, and I could have, but, but I realized my purpose wasn't really statistic. I was just, it was a, it was a competitive moment for me to say, I'm not going to let that beat me. But what I should have said was, that's not where my interest is, right? I'm, I need to move over to economics where I really love that environment. That made me, that was passionate about that. I loved it. And, and that's the space I wanted to live in. And 
and but I didn't do it. So I, I, I share a lot of people there. There's some, some fighting with jobs, right? And they're like, I'm going to show this boss that I'm the best worker there ever been. Yes. Are they loving their work? And if you really don't, maybe, you know, you'd be better off finding something that fits you yeah. right? and, and fits your purpose. I think often parents say to kids, um, finish everything you start. <laughs> and, and we think that's a good idea. And, and in many things, it is a good idea. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, I know people who, if they start reading a book, they won't finish a book. Um, and I say to them, like, if you're, if you're not free to stop finishing that book, you're not free to keep finishing that yeah, book, you know? Right, and if, right. if, if a book's a horrible book after 20 pages, you know, I do believe you should move on at okay. times. I believe that um, we find ourselves in situations sometimes for a season, Yes. you know? And I think sometimes God calls us to things for a season. Yes. I think we have a tendency to want things to last forever. Yes. You know, yes. Um, some people came to my wife and I recently and and asked us to donate some money to um, to a religious community that, that had been around for uh, about 100 years. And um, and it was a group of nuns uh, and there was only 11 of them left. And um, and the average age was, I think, 81 mm. and. Um, and the people who were presenting this were saying, you know, this, this needs to last forever. And, you know, m my position is that, no, that, that's up to God. That's right. You know, right. and um, not everything should last forever. He, right. he sent these women to deal with actually a very specific problem right. at a very specific time. Mm -hmm. They did that. They did that well. They did that faithfully. And, and, and that need is not in God's plan anymore. Right. So um, now do we take care of these 11 elderly women who have faithfully served mm -hmm. uh, God and his people? Absolutely. Yes. But yes. we don't need to sustain this movement yes. Um, yes. forever. Uh, so I do believe that at times we need to move on. And I do believe you should stop reading bad books. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, well said. Well as soon as well you realize it's a bad book. <laughs> It's hard for me. I still keep it. I'm like, you know, and I, I think my struggle with that is I, I'll keep a bad book and I'll keep reading it or I will listen to it on tape because I always think this, the last chapter, the second to last chapter may have, may have all the meat. Yeah. Right. And I, I don't want to miss something. Right. So it's, it's also about what type of person are you? Yes. Are you a person that's always hopeful that something is there or are you... Are you in, in a position where you feel like it is what it is? Yes. Right. I need to abort. Right. And um, and more often than not, there's nothing at the end. Yeah. <laughs> but but sometimes you just want to want to make sure that that's what it is. Hundred percent. You also talk in the book about learning to win the Lu way. What is the Lu way? You know that as we talked earlier, that is the trust, love, and commitment way. Right. That's a way of of doing it in a way that you build. <laughs> strong community within your team yeah. right you you show true love with people um um you you have a commitment and when i say a commitment <laughs> we had a gentleman by the we had two line running backs and we were playing usc this was our national championship year we were playing usc at usc in the coliseum and it was a night game and they were ranked number two we were ranked number one so the last game of the season, whoever win this game would be playing number three in the national championship, which would be West Virginia. And I remember us having dinner that Friday night, and there was going to be millions of people watching. This, and they were everybody was saying, "This really is the national championship." Dick Bite, everybody was like, "This is the national championship." And we're sitting in dinner, and those two running backs didn't show up. Mm. And he had a rule: if you're late for any meetings, you don't play. Wow. So we were like, hmm, they're not here. And no one knew where they were. We only brought three running backs. You're only allowed to bring 60 some odd players to a game. That's it. So you only, we only brought three running backs that left with one. So finally they walked in the door probably an, an hour after the time in which they were supposed to be present. And Holtz asked them to head back to their row. And he came to the seniors 
because we didn't have opportunity to come back. And he says, listen, I'm not interested in having them play. But you guys are seniors, you don't get to come back. So you get to choose if you think they should play or not. And we were like, hmm. And it was, they gave us this room in the hotel and, and it was just the seniors. And we fought for about an hour. And at the end we said, you know, we talked about trusting one another. We talked about having love for one another. And we talked about a commitment of being on time and doing things the right way. And that's how we're gonna run this team. And if they didn't follow through with that, we need to hold them accountable. And we went back to Holtz and said, we don't think they should play. He said, okay, Flash, I want you to tell the team they shouldn't play. So I went, wait a coach, you're the coach, right? But so I go in front of this team and it's freshmen, juniors, and South, and, and uh, freshmen, Southwest, and juniors. And uh, we share with them and I said, listen, we, we put time into this conversation and we really believe they shouldn't play. And everybody lost their selves. And, um, and they're like, Flash, this is a, we're talking about national championship, but we have a philosophy here, right? And we have a, 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 a mission and a vision of how we want to run this team. And if people are gonna take advantage of it, we don't think they should play. So at the end, he put them on a plane and they flew home that night. Mm -hmm. We only had one running back. And that one running back, everybody, on the team, went to that one running back and told him how great he was going to play. Now, he normally never plays, but they said, man, you're going to have the best game of your life. And it's USC, so it's hot. <laughs> so we didn't even know he could make it through the whole game, but we, you're going to have a great game. And, and that night, the offense had a conversation. They said, listen, offensive line said, we're going to block better than we've ever blocked before. You're going to have the biggest holes you've ever had. And the defense says, listen, if they can't score, they can't win. That's our commitment to this movement. Once the, the bidding junkies found out about the departure of our two running backs, you know, the, the bids changed and they felt we were gonna be the losers of that respective team. At the end of the game, we won that game 28 to maybe 17. And, um, and guess who was MVP of the game? Running back. The running back. Mm -hmm. The guy that no one thought could could perform. Yeah. So so you know at the end of the day, when you inspire people, when you tell people how great they are, imagine every day you tell somebody how good they are, and they live it out. <laughs> they actually live it out. Yeah. And he 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 proved to us that he was exactly who he's supposed to be, and he'd had no confidence four hours ago but he had confidence enough to become the MVP of the game. And, you know, so I share, I always share that story because we didn't supposed to win. Yes. But the foundation in which our team was, was found in all was trust, love, and commitment. And that means letting your best players leave to win. No one's willing to take that risk. It's called faith. No one had the faith that we could excel in that way, but we did and we won. So in an organization, I say, if you have a vision statement, you live by it. Yeah. Don't compromise it, right? Mm -hmm. If you have Christ in your life and there's some things that compromise that, don't do it. Yeah. Right? Live by the values in which you've established for yourself. Last question. You only get to give one more speech. <laughs> what would be your closing point of, of your last speech? Wow, my closing point. You know what it is it's it's interesting, and I share this with a lot of people. Um, you know, life is about change, and um, I, there is probably so many people that want to change in life. And I remember sharing this at a speech, and I and I try to close with it often. And it's this young lady that I knew when I was in line signing books. And she said, thank you so much for the message. She was 53 years old. She said, thank you so much for the message. I said, you're welcome. And, and thought, you know, I'd sign the book and she'd move on and the other person come. But she said, I wanted to also be an attorney just like you, mm. but I wanted to be a civil rights attorney. And I said, well, why aren't you a civil rights attorney? She said, I'm, 50, I'm 53 years old. And uh, I said, okay, well, I act like I didn't hear. I said, well, why aren't you an attorney? 
So I'm 53 years old, Flash. Um, I, I'm 53. And the people are getting a little irritated behind her. And I said, I stood up. I said, why? She said, I'm just too old. I'm not too old. I'm too old to go to law school and be an attorney. And I said, I said well, let me just present one thing to you. And I told the people behind her, just give me one second. <laughs> and I said, listen, you're 53. How long does it take you to get through law school? She said, three years. I said, you're going to be 56. I give you two options. One is you do nothing and you arrive at 53, the same person you are at, at you are 56, the same person you are at 53. That's one option. The second option, if you apply and you get in and you actually graduate and become this high profile attorney, civil rights attorney that may be arguing in front of the Supreme Court and have Martin Luther King twirling in his grave, right? Because of the movement that you're making. That's option two. Either way, you're gonna, you're gonna be reaching 56. You get to choose. So I share with so many people, they're contemplating that they're too old or, too, or they're not prepared yet. Or that, I just say, just do it, right? Because it's coming anyway, whatever that is in your life. So start doing it today yeah. so that you can prepare yourself for the next two, three, four years or next 20, 30, 40 years of your life doing what you really love doing. Love it. Yeah. My guest, Daryl Flash Gordon, the book, Change Does Not Occur in a Flash. Daryl, thank you so much for your time today. Matthew, thank you for the unbelievable questions. Wow, it's so powerful. Thank you so much for all that you do and, and your team and your organization. And thank you for always uplifting uh, Christ in the way that you do. I appreciate that. You're very welcome. Amen. Good to be with you. You too.